I opposed the petition because I was already familiar with uh, Gandhi and who he was. And as a matter of fact, I was driving right along this road behind us. And I saw the statue. And I said, who is this? And I looked and I saw it's Gandhi. And I said, people must not know who this man is. And I took some photos and then I uh, sent an email to all staff here at the University of Ghana, along with about 70 of his most racist quotes. Not a few, but like about 77 of his most racist quotes to everyone on campus. Now, the reaction from most people was we had no idea. We saw the movie. We thought this is a great guy. The movie, which was sponsored by the Indian government as a piece of propaganda, but that's a sidebar. But most people had no idea much less had they researched and read. Now, the uh, complete works of um, Mahatma Gandhi, or as we prefer, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, is out there. Everything that he has ever written is all together in, I want to say, 99 volumes thereabout. So you can go through letters that he's written, so forth and so on, and things that he's written in Hindi, in Gujarati. And this is really the issue that there were so many people who thought he was so great because they can't read Hindi. <laughs> they can't read Gujarati. If Dr. Martin Luther King could read it, or you know Nelson Mandela could read it, or uh, Kwame Nkrumah could read it, they would have had a vastly different picture. But now, for us as researchers, me, I'm a research coordinator at the Institute of African Studies, Language, Literature, and Drama, so I've, re I've read about Gandhi, and my first time hearing about it, a historian, Dr. John Henry Clark, he said that Mah uh, Mahatma Gandhi was a fraud and a faker. I heard this back in the early 90s, like 92 thereabout. I said, wow. I wonder where he's coming from with this. So I started reading about it. I started reading about the plight of the untouchables, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, who wrote the book, What Congress and Gandhi Have Done to the Untouchables. Mm -hmm. So once you know better, you have to do better. And this is really a strike, a blow for black dignity, black self-respect, striking out throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Many parts of the world hail Mahatma Gandhi. Why Africa should oppose such a figure? Very good. When we think about it, we have to put it in context in terms of who was Gandhi to us as black people. Mm. And when you're familiar with the history, you come to find that he was actually a sergeant major in the army fighting against the Zulus in which thousands and thousands of Zulus were killed. And he was also the one who really instituted what we could call institutional apartheid there in South Africa because he was the one who clamored to make sure that the Indians could have a different office from, uh, sorry, a different entrance into the post office and to the telegraph office there in Durban, South Africa, that he was someone who was a virulent racist. He agitated to get guns so that they could shoot all of the Kaffir blacks. But because the British didn't regard him as high enough as the British, even though he said that we're all coming from the same Indo-Aryan stock, they didn't give him guns. And we're happy because otherwise he would have been as bad as Colonel uh, Dwyer, who shot down so many Indians. Mm -hmm. The only difference between Gandhi and Dwyer is that Gandhi just didn't get the opportunity and didn't get the weapons. So anytime we look at anything, we should see it from our perspective, an African-centered perspective, as we do at African Studies. Mm -hmm. So as African people, what did he do for or against African people? And we can look at not only his words, but his deeds in fighting in wars against the black people. When he went back to India, he fought against the Dalits, who are the black untouchables of India. So these are the things that many people are not aware of, but as soon as you become aware of it, you have to do something different. You have to change your behavior. So, some also may have said that this is an academic community and should have known better. Uh, but why do you think University of Ghana would in the first place have such a figure erected on campus? Very good. Now, people did not know better um, and people were not consulted in general. So this was something that was done by the higher ups. We won't say any names, but we know who they are. And they decided to just place a statue because I'm sure that they were under the same impression of most of the world, where if you go to a Martin Luther King memorial, you'll see Gandhi there. If you go to Senegal, you'll see Gandhi. They put these statues, South Africa, they put these statues all over. And it literally depends on ignorance for anyone to accept the statue. Now the people in Malawi heard what we did here, and they have a court injunction where they stop the statue from being there. Because for us as black people, we have to have black dignity. We have to have black self-respect. If you say that, oh, my plate is nothing but a rubbish bin, then the whole world will collect rubbish in it. But when you say my plate is a wonderful plate, then people are, really, are willing to eat off of it. So when we don't have respect for ourselves, when the rest of the world, you go to Europe and they are throwing bananas at you when you're playing football, when you go to India and they're beating you down, when you're going to the U.S., the black person does not have a very high level of respect in the world. 
but it starts from self-respect. If someone who called you one degree removed from an animal, you put him on a, on a campus at a black university, an African university, it means that you must not know very much about yourself. But it's not everyone who's in that position. So those of us who knew, who have read, who studied, we are the ones who agitated. Because imagine if you put, again, Colonel Dwyer was this British man who shot down so many of these Indians in a massacre. Imagine if you put him in a university at New Delhi. Imagine if you put him at a university. It means that you, all the scholars, you must not know anything about your history. Mm -hmm. It will be a slap in the face. And that's how many of us took it as a slap in the face that some of us know better and we don't just go along with the propaganda or what some of us call improper Gandhi. Mm -hmm. It's improper propaganda about Gandhi. A lot of people also say this might mar the relationship between Ghana and India, especially now that the statue of their former leader has been taken away. Don't you think that would cause some kind of skirmishes between the two countries? You know, actually, I just answered an email from someone in India, uh, Colonel G.B. Singh, probably the world's foremost scholar on Gandhi. Uh, we have been in contact with uh, Arundhati Roy. So many Indians who have been collaborating on this project and really have been part of the force that have helped to publicize it as well. Now, what this means is that you have in India, India is not as united as you may think, that you have castes, right? So you have the Brahmins, you have the Kshatriyas, you have the Vaishyas, you have the Shudras. So all of these are the castes that are part of Hinduism on the simple scale, because even in that you have subgroupings. So Gandhi himself was Banya, which is a subcaste of the Vaishyas. Now, even outside of that, you have the outcasts, you have the Dalits, you have the untouchables, the black untouchables of India, and these are the ones who are downtrodden. So the people of India, there are so many uh, Indian groups, some who have even done videos that are up online supporting us in this, that there are some who have been downtrodden ever since these Indo-Aryans have been crushing them on the basis of they consider themselves to be white and they know that the indigenous people there are black. And that's part of why when black students like yourself go there to study, they are beaten to death. A man in Congo was beaten to death in broad daylight in India. Why? Because they treat black Africans the same way they, teach, they treat their indigenous black people there. You understand? And again, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar said that Gandhi was the worst enemy of the untouchable people. So I want you to put these things in perspective. So it's not all of India. It's these upper caste Hindus who have been impressing the black people there in India. So we should not get it marred. So if you have upper caste elites here who are connected to those upper caste white Indo-Aryans, uh, Indo we have to start now question these elites. What are you doing you know, in that relationship with them. Because those of us who are on the ground, the people, we're connected to the black people there in India. We have solidarity with the black people there in India. Okay. So finally, is this the end to the hashtag Handy Must Fall movement? Especially now that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has taken over the statue of this individual we are talking about. As I mentioned in Malawi, they're still fighting. And matter of fact, I got an email from someone from Malawi, uh, Mkotama, he says, we will not relent, you know, congratulations, we will not relent, we will keep the fight. And I said, beautiful, that's, that's all we can expect and all we can hope for. Again, truth has to reign, no matter how popular the lie is, you know, even if a lie takes a thousand years to go on a journey in a single day, truth will catch up to it. And that's really what the story of Gandhi is all about. And I'm aware that the government of India has a program through soft power where they're trying to put these statues, All the, they've commissioned this, as a government to put these statues of Gandhi all around the world. And we can look at it as their proxy war with China for soft power. If you remember the border dispute that just happened last year, that China is very heavy in Africa because everyone knows except for Africans that whosoever controls Africa controls the world. All of the coltan for your phone to work, the blood diamonds, the uranium that powers France, every single thing that you can imagine, whoever controls Africa controls the world. So we have to now look at this. India is the one who built uh, Flagstaff House, which is now again Jubilee House. They said that they would give 200 million to make a new parliament building. So what they're saying is that we've bought your president and we've bought your parliament. This is what they're trying to tell us. And then I saw uh, Nanado who was standing there with a check for a million dollars to renovate right after this Gandhi situation came in. So we have to now question this. Are we just going to be pawns in a proxy war with China and India? Because everyone is coming here. The U.S. is coming here with a military base. Uh, 
you know, the British, Francophonie, we're hearing all these things. Everyone is rushing to Africa, but many of our youth are rushing across the Sahara Desert to the Mediterranean. What do all these people see that we do not see? What type of education are we getting here if all of our students, our young people, have an unemployed graduate association and can't understand that we have to come together as black people, regardless of location, for black issues of black dignity and black self-respect? So I don't think it's done because I know that they have many more statues there as they're trying to push in soft power, the Kung Kung Baja, all of these things that we're seeing, the Confucius Institute from China, everyone is trying to get a foothold here in Africa. So I don't think it's done. Not to even say uh, if the ministry wants to erect this particular exactly. structure anywhere on, exactly. on the soil of Ghana, exactly. it's not necessary? You know, I, I, that's a major concern. You know, so people were asking me, even my colleague, Dr. Pierre Giatria, who was at the School of Law, he says, have you heard where it's going? I said, no, I haven't heard. Because they did, just the way they brought it under the cover of darkness, they didn't tell anyone that this is going on, a very small thing, the same way it left this morning and no one knew. I got a call from Radio Universe that says, oh, you know, the thing is gone. Uh, can you tell us your thoughts? I said, you're the one who's informing me. I didn't even know it's gone. So these are the things, you know, if it comes up, this is why I would say Aluta Continua, mm. because we don't know where Gandhi will rear his ugly head next. Okay. He will go all over as part of the soft power face of India. I'm grateful. But finally, I want you, I mean, pick your thoughts on how a security guard was put uh, in here to, I mean, guard <laughs> the statue? This is an excellent question. Now, you know, on campus, things are not always peaceful, that we've had women who have been attacked on campus. It's not rampant, you know, it's generally a peaceful place, but there were no security guards given to every single woman to protect her. These are real life African women, you understand? But meanwhile, an inanimate object, a statue has 24 seven security. What does that tell you about how about what I was saying before about respect? How can anyone in the world respect someone who would do something like that? You don't value your own people, the black people who are the the Africans, continental Africans who are being beaten to death right there in India. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we haven't heard anything from them about that to date. I check the news all the time. You know, I've studied about India. I've read about the untouchables for decades now. You understand? But I haven't heard anything protesting either the plight of the Dalits, the black untouchables there, or about the African students who are getting beaten every single day because they're getting the same treatment that the indigenous black people are getting there. So I would just say in short, <laughs> if I can be short on this issue, I think it's a travesty. You understand that you have 24-7 security on an inanimate object. Meanwhile, the suffering of our black people there in India, there's no security for those African students who are beaten daily, stabbed to death. A man out of Congo who was beaten to death in broad daylight. We don't hear anything about it. Okay. I'm grateful, sir. Thank you, too.